Hi, I'm Maricela Martinez Cola. Don't be afraid of the R. Uh, it's basically the D sound. So, ma di sela. I grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan, the serial capital of the world, where you will find Kellogg's headquarters. My mother is from Reynosa, Mexico, and my father is from Donna, Texas. I have 11 aunts and uncles and 47 first cousins at last count. And this is just on my mom's side. I haven't even tried counting on my papi's side yet. <laughs> I'd be exhausted. <laughs> I'm the oldest of three girls and the first in my family to attend college. I married my best friend, and we have a son who lights up our life every day. Finally, I am a very proud Chicana from Michigan. So I'm a Michicana. <laughs> now, almost all of my family, both sides, moved to Battle Creek. Um, to this day, I believe that we were singularly responsible for the rise in the Latino population that year. Aside from my family, I didn't really have examples of Latinidad outside of my home. That was until I discovered a remarkable TV show. Sesame Street. <laughs> I loved Sesame Street. Grover was my favorite, which is probably why I love the color blue. But what I loved the most about it was the diversity of Sesame Street. Not just the blue and green and yellow residents, but Gordon, Luis, Maria, Bob, and Mr. Hooper. It was the first time I saw someone that looked like my family on TV. I, I mean, I had a Theo Luis. And my tia's name, my aunt's name, was Maria. I mean, come on, wow. You can imagine that this blew my little five-year-old mind. I didn't realize how much that TV show influenced me until about a year later. Um, not a year later, until I got to college. Yeah, that'd be like six years old. <laughs> so let's fast forward to 1993 at the University of Michigan. It was the first time I had a group of Chicano friends who were just like me. I was part of a multicultural club in my residence hall. It was a very amazing and validating time in my life. Then it came time to select a major. I went to this thing called a course catalog that listed every course taught at the University of Michigan. I had no clue how to pick a major, so I just circled all the classes I wanted to take, and the most circles were in psychology and African-American African studies. Leave it to me, the overachiever of the family, to uh, pick two, not just one major. Later on, my friends and I were kind of sitting around chilling and talking about our majors. When I told them that, I, that one of my majors was African American, African studies, my more militant friends were like, what? Why aren't you majoring in Latino studies? Why would you choose African American studies? You're a Latina, you're a Chicana. When I told my family, they said, what do you think, you're black? And this wasn't about being anti-black. For my friends, it was a matter of demonstrating pride in my cultural identity and learning all the things that my K-12 education kept from me. My family thought it was a rejection of my Mexican heritage, a rejection of them and their struggle to get to the U.S., but that wasn't the case at all. So when I struggled to try to explain it to them, believe it or not, that old Sesame Street song popped into my head. Who are the people in your neighborhood? <laughs> and so I explained, look, I know my house. I know my culture. I know it inside and out. I've lived in my house for 18 years. I love my house. I love tamales at Christmas, having rice at beans at almost every meal, listening to the corridos, hearing stories about Pancho Villa, speaking Spanglish. <laughs> I love my house. But now I want to get to know my neighbors. So I majored in African Amer Amer American Studies, and I got to know some beautiful, amazing neighbors. My classes and incredible professors filled my heart and mind and spirit with black history, 
black art, activism, and literature. I received messages of pain and brilliance and, and excellence against all odds. So I thought to myself, if this is what I discover when I meet my black neighbors, so to speak, what will I find when I meet my other Latino, Asian American, and Native American indigenous neighbors? So I dedicated my professional career to multicultural affairs and began populating my neighborhood in my mind and heart with black, Latinx, Asian American, and indigenous art, history, and literature. As I learned, I saw connections. Beautiful, inspiring, heart-wrenching connections. For example, when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I was completely inspired. But learning about Malcolm X helped me to connect him to one of my Chicano heroes, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. He was called the fists of the Chicano movement. And that led me to learn about Yuri Koshiyama, an amazing Japanese-American activist who actually worked alongside Malcolm X and was there with him at the time of his death. And later, I learned about Mary Bravebird, a writer and a member of the American Indian movement. They all taught me to love, protect, and fight for my neighborhood. Reading I, Too, Am America by, po by poet Langston Hughes made me hungry to read Audre Lorde, a self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet. And after that, I learned about Gloria Ansaldúa, whose book Borderlands made me feel seen. And then there was Janice Muir Katani, an American, a Japanese American poet who taught me that I am loved and worthy. And Joy Harjo, a Native American poet who inspired me to remember my history. Their words, helped me find my words. So finally, this deep connection, this deep desire for connections influenced my research and teaching as a professor. Now, I know you can't put an equal sign between all of these experiences. You don't want to do that. But there are enough similarities that you can put the mathematical simile line between them. So I research school desegregation. Most people know about Brown versus Board of Education, the famous case that ended the legal practice of separate but equal. But I studied law, and I knew there had to be cases involving Mexican-American, indigenous, and Asian-American plaintiffs. Sure enough, after some research, I found that in 1947, seven years before Brown, there was Mendez v. Westminster, a case involving Mexican-American families fighting for educational equality. 30 years before Brown, there was Alice Piper in Piper v. Big Pine. She and her family filed a lawsuit to allow the Native American Paiute children to attend one of the local white schools in Big Pine, California. Finally, almost 70 years before Brown, in 1885, there was Tate v. Hurley, a case where a Chinese-American family argued that not allowing their daughter, Mamie Tate, to attend the white school closest to her home was unjust, immoral, and racially prejudicial. These four brave school girls, Linda Brown, Sylvia Mendez, Alice Piper, and Mamie Tate, gave me the privilege of sharing my beautiful neighborhood with others in my forthcoming book. <laughs> And my students and I are working on an interactive digital map for social studies teachers. I love the idea of young Black, Latinx, Asian American, Indigenous children clicking on this map and seeing themselves as history makers. And hopefully, I'd like to be able to eventually have a children's book. <laughs> okay, Dr. MC, that's what my students call me. So what's your point? So I'm here to ask you, who are the people in your neighborhood? Here in Utah, it's very easy to say, I grew up in an all-white neighborhood. I went to a really white school. I attended a predominantly white church. I hear this a lot from my students. And to them, I say, 
Your physical neighborhood may not be diverse, but the neighborhood in your mind and heart is ever-growing. Get to know your neighborhood. And this means filling your life with books and uh, movies and art and music and documentaries, all of these things that represent all of the phenomenal neighbors that you have yet to meet. It's all there, uh, especially in this digital age, y'all. Uh, y'all can be able to figure something out, right? First, though, you got to start small, right? So if you like classical music, just Google African-American composers, and the first thing that pops up is nine black composers who changed the course of classical music. If you love reading science fiction, Google Latino science fiction writers, and there you'll see a link to five books by Latino authors that will satisfy any sci-fi junkie. They're there. I, I promise you, I Googled them right before this talk. Look, there's no reason to say I never knew. There's no reason to say I never had the opportunity. Even here in Utah, there is such beautiful diversity here, too. Your neighbors are there, y'all, and they are fascinating. I got to know my neighbors, and I learned that true unity comes when you are as transformed by your neighbor's experiences as they are by yours. Thank you.